So, ladies and gentlemen, the aftermath, okay, of the Stefan Diggs trade yesterday. I'm sure if you tuned into myself or if you tuned into Zbot's show or if you tuned into Kevin's show, you probably heard a lot of the same things. You probably heard of some other takes. But now that we've had a little over 24 hours to digest the news, some more information has come out about his current contract over in Houston. I think several of us have accepted the fact. Here it is. Here it is. Kevin, how's life, my friend? I didn't even talk to you after this whole news because I feel like I was just trying to, you know, digest it myself. But what's up? Life's wonderful, man. I mean, what? Look, it's another day in paradise. We get to talk Bills football. The Bills met with Lad McConkey apparently twice. Um, I heard so that. That's music to my ears. Ultimately, I think they double dip at that position now, Dan. Um, and look, they got a second round pick for a rental, right? So ultimately, the Texans eliminated three years of the deal. They escalated all $23 million of guaranteed money into this year. And it was much more for the Bills saving cash, cap, and they got a draft choice from it. So we didn't get screwed as hard as initially thought. Zbot, and so I know obviously, like myself, I was pretty emotional yesterday as well. And even into this morning, how are you feeling today on Thursday, a day after the shot heard around the world? Yeah, I'm, I'm still left with more questions than answers. The biggest question to me above anything, what happened to get to this point and why was Stefan Diggs so disgruntled? I put out there after the Bean press conference, I essentially asked this question to Twitter, which, you know, anytime you ask a question to Twitter, I mean, brace yourself. Absolutely. And I, I essentially... You know, asked the hypothetical in, in that what happened to get to this point? What was the final straw? How did this come to be? And I insinuated that, you know, Diggs wanted out. How you could take anything else from this situation is insane to me. It's the Bills would not have taken a $31 million cap hit with no other wide receiver close to being a wide receiver one currently on the roster if he didn't borderline demand out or put Brandon Bean in a corner where you have to assume Brandon Bean's in the position where he's thinking, I might as well try to get value out of this while I can, because th this is, th these are the cards I'm being dealt currently. But my biggest question surrounding all of this is why Stefan Diggs during his time in Buffalo, they won 11 games or more each and every season. They went to at least the divisional round or further every season. No one had more targets in the league than Stefan Diggs during his time in Buffalo. He had, what, a 1,000 yards or more each season. Every year, he was a major focal point of this offense, if not the most major focal point of this offense. And let's be honest, his time in Buffalo was the best duration of his career. What happened to get to this point where Stephon Diggs essentially did what he did to Minnesota, to Buffalo? What he did to Minnesota at the time made sense. I don't want to play for Kirk Cousins. I don't see that this franchise being in a position to go in the direction I want to go in. Let me go play for a quarterback that's going to take me there. It's an, it's unarguable that Josh Allen's a top three quarterback in this league, and it's unarguable that with Stephon Diggs, his career flourished. Both of their careers flourished. I don't think we talk about Stephon Diggs in the same light we do now if he had stayed in Minnesota. He got out of it what he wanted. Sure, he didn't get a Super Bowl ring. Nobody else really has, unless you've been wearing white, yellow, and, 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 uh, and red the last few seasons. What happened? What If I could read Stefan Diggs' mind, mm -hmm. what is going through the thought process to get to where we're at now? That's, where, that's the only thing I just do not understand. He had it as good as any receiver had it in the league. Like I yeah. said, the most targets, the most involved in an offense you could possibly want if you're a wide receiver. They were winning towards the top of the league. And in the playoff exits, if that's the argument, wasn't like he was the one leading the charge and they went out sad because of it. It wasn't like his numbers were flourishing in those games that they lost. I understand the frustration, but at the end of the day, when you come full circle and try to fully fathom why he wanted this situation to occur, I, for the life of me, cannot find the answer. The unfortunate reality, fellas, is I don't think we'll ever know the answer, but I'm as perplexed now as I was yesterday, and I'll probably feel this way till the end of time. See, I'll tell you what, um, and so I'm not sure if you caught so the um, so the herd today with Colin Coward. Yep. And I'm definitely not taking it as the gospel because it is Colin Coward. But allegedly, he said that at the end of that Bengals game and toward the beginning of the season, 
Josh Allen just had a fuck like had enough of it. Like he just had enough of like the consistent like bitching and everything about like targets and everything along those lines. My theory is is that they were done with Stephon Diggs after that Cincinnati Bengals game. I really do. Like all the pieces are just falling together because I feel like that we tend to forget about when he ended up storming out of like mini camp after that meeting he ended up having with McDermott and he came back. And then obviously the whole marketing team goes on this PR stunt where they catch him smiling a couple of times. And uh, yeah, yeah, dude. Like he's like shaking hands with Josh Allen, but it's, you notice a change in behavior about when asked, when both of them were asked about each other, you rewind two or three years ago and they would go on damn soliloquies, like novels of how much that they appreciate the guys. But then this year going into it, like you just see like facial expressions of Josh Allen, especially at the beginning of the season down in the dumps. And he would be super short with every single answer that he would say when asked about, Oh, how's your relationship with this fond digs? You'd be like, Oh, he's my guy. Oh, he's my friend. I have a feeling that, not only was this a Josh Allen thing, I do think that he was the one that probably gave the blessing at the end of the day. He was ready to walk away from this guy immediately. The second that he had Joe Brady take over, he was just like, dude, I know you want to make him a focal point of this offense, but we can win another way. And it was basically him rebelling from the idea that he better give Diggs his targets or he's going to be upset. He just said, fuck it. And so I'm going to do whatever I want. And so I'm the quarterback of this team. I'm getting sick of all the stuff that's being in the locker room. That's my gut feeling of the situation. Kev, what do you think about that? When did this all blow up? When was the true moment, you think? Break it down a little bit, right? So the Bills were very interested in receiving a pick. It was said they wanted a second this year. I'm not yeah. quite sure if that would have ever came to fruition. But the, they didn't have the Minnesota pick as of about 10 days ago, roughly. So at some point, you could argue that this didn't come to fruition until about then, about a week ago. So I think that at some point, the Bills realized we can go ahead and move move along from this. I don't. I believe they would have played free agency a little bit differently, in my opinion, had they made this decision in early March. I do believe it happened later on in March. I do think they had enough money that they could have moved around a little bit to go acquire another free agent, possibly in the market. I don't know that you can convince me with solid grounds that they made this decision a month plus ago. I think it's something that popped up. I think it's just like, all right, we're we're done here. Let's re-engage with Houston. We laughed at him at the combine, whatever it may have been. And let's see what they'll offer because I'm not interested in their third round pick, which is like in the eighties, 85. We we want something more. Let's see. They got this Minnesota pick. We think they might, they're not quite frankly, the bills don't think the Vikings are going to be good in my opinion. Otherwise they would have just acquired their original second round pick of the Texans. They do not think the Vikings are going to be good. And they said, we'll bank on not taking a third this year in return for possibly a top 40 pick next year with Sam Darnold. So I think that that's their hope that maybe they trade Jefferson. Maybe they, whatever happens there, they're running a rookie quarterback, they're running Darnold and they acquired a top 40 pick. Uh, for a player in their mind, save $20 million in cash, $28 million in cap. And the number one thing people forget about dead cap, we don't pay him another dime. Dead cap is just an accounting term. It's just the amount of money that's already been paid to him. It's not at all. Everyone's like, you're paying him $31 million to play for the tech. Not true. The Texans took on $21 million guaranteed and are paying him every penny of it including having to remove the remaining years of the deal. And the Bills got a potential top 40 pick. I think Bean was good with that. But I I ultimately think that that came to fruition in the last week or two. I don't think you can convince me that it was longer than that. I 100% agree because at the during the press conference, Bean said that about a month ago, he, he flat out said that they had not made a decision one way or the other. In GM terms, you could look at that a variety of ways, but to your point, Kev, maybe the way you look at that is it wasn't even on the mind. I have to think that there had to have been some sort of discussion in regard to his status on the team prior to anything getting serious just because of the amount of hearsay that was being tossed around for about the last two years or so. I'm in full agreement with you. He said that he didn't think things got all that serious until pretty much this week or roughly around a week ago, if that. I looked at it from what Brandon Bean had said, and I I took away from it that this was really the only offer on the table. It seemed that at the time, 
this was going to be the best they're going to get, not only now, but in the future, should they hold on to him. I also got a vibe that it felt like if they didn't move off of him, they would have been put in a real awkward situation moving into the season. Because if Diggs had backed them into a corner to where they're willing to do what they just did, I have to think that the leverage on Diggs' side was that he was either saying he wasn't going to be playing for this team this coming year or he was going to hold out in camp or whatever. I, I don't know exactly what to take from it, but it just feels like uh, the way it happened so fast, the compensation, which when we break it down more like you just did, it does seem better than initially thought. But at the end of the day, the way that this team is currently structured with the wide receiver room, it would have been a lot more beneficial, you'd think, for the Bills to keep Stephon Diggs than get rid of him. But at the end of uh, when it, when it comes down to it, the reason they got rid of him wasn't because of the play on the field, wasn't because of the production, wasn't because of their utilization of him. Something happened between him and either McDermott being one of the rotations at the offensive coordinator or Josh Allen. It could be a combination of both. The thing that really sucks the most, and we talked about this yesterday, Dan and I, we, we discussed the fact that for about a year and a half, we would take Diggs' ominous tweets, we would take the random comments he'd give to a reporter here and then a reporter here. And then he'd go back and say, I've already told you what I've said. And what he said was, I want to be here. I want to retire here. And we all pretty much carried his water for him. We all took that word as gospel. And we pretty much wrote off everything he tweeted, everything he said to anybody else. And in hindsight, the breadcrumbs were there all along. It's still as shocking uh, as, as it gets, in my opinion, watching it unfold yesterday. But when you really break it down, it probably shouldn't have been that shocking. My biggest frustration for the whole thing is that we were pretty much told by him to not press him on questioning whether or not he wanted to be a Buffalo Bill because he had already given us the answer. And the answer he gave us was that he wanted to. Well, clearly, he didn't want to. So there's so yeah. many things at play here. I posted a video earlier of Florio and uh Chris Sims going at it earlier, debating over the relationship between Josh Allen. The reason people like them are having these arguments, the reason we're having discussions about this is whether you're a, a top level insider or, or us on here talking about it, uh, doing Bill's YouTube, no yeah. one has any clue what the hell happened here. And when you really break down the career he had there, it doesn't make sense how it got to this point. So yeah. it's more head scratching than anything. But in regard to losing the player itself, the way all of this has transpired, I feel less sick about it than I thought I probably would if this ended up coming to fruition. So uh, yeah. the, the, the Bills clearly showed you they're, they're in the process of turning a major page here when they unloaded pretty much every veteran on this team with a, with a C on their chest, every guy we've come to know and love uh, on this team for the last six years or so. It, it almost felt like if you're Brandon Bean, this is a situation you're put in. You've already ripped the Band-Aid off. You might as well rip the entire cast off while you're at it and get this new regime completely started and reloaded here in 2024 and try to fuel this team for the next chapter this season and beyond. Just well, because, you know, it's funny because last night, like last night on the AFC East roundtable, um, funny enough, it was TD that actually pointed this out to me. And he goes, listen, I know that it seems bleak over there and everyone in Bill's Mafia is looking back with nostalgia of what it was like the past couple of years. This whole team, the absolute peak was the AFC championship. And then afterwards, it was just a divisional loss and a divisional loss. Why not retool? Because obviously this whole squad that we've had, that, that we've grown to love so much, I think this is probably something that we should be able to accept at this point. It sucks because we're used to Hyde. We're used to Poyer. We're used to Gabe Davis. We're used to... Stephon Diggs. We loved all of those players. We think that they gave us their best shot, but they had damn three chances to do it. And we've just been seeing signs of regression. So I've grown to accept it as well, but I do think that there was a last straw. While I do believe that maybe the decision to actually pull the trigger was on the table for about a week, I think that they were probably juggling with the idea of whether or not that they were going to do it to eat that amount of dead money at the beginning. And as Kevin pointed out, it is just an accounting sent from that. It still sucks for this year, but there had to be a last straw. And as much as that you sure tweet pissed me off and the night before, I don't think it was that one. Surprisingly enough, I think it was when he just ended up tweeting well, dot, 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 literally minutes after the word was announced that we ended up signing Curtis Samuel. 
that was the one right there where I sure he already knew he was going to be a Houston Texan too. That's why he said it. Uh, you know, the up for whatever type thing. We go back to the K Adams interview where it just felt like, you know, you almost started to feel bad for him in a way because he kept being barraged with these questions about being in Buffalo. And he seemed pretty staunch in his stance that he wanted to be there. And, And the frustration seemed to stem not from not wanting to be in Buffalo, but from being asked if he wants to be in Buffalo or not. And at the end of the day, the other the other question you have to ask too is why were those questions even being asked in the first place? That's the odd thing. What led to people having to ask Stephon Diggs if he wants to be in Buffalo? You don't see all these other wide receivers being asked. This sure get moves get made all the time, but you don't see a, a constant routine question be asked to an individual player like that as as much as it was. It was annoying. And, and, and without any good reason behind it. So the whole thing to me is just very, very odd. And, and once again, it's another one of these things you add to the list uh, over the last few years here that just kind of makes you, ha- you scratch your head and think, what really is going on over there? Things have been so great with the Bills in comparison to what they were for 20 plus years or around that time frame that it's really easy to overlook some of these oddities that are happening over at one bills drive. But this is just one more thing on the plate here. And we never get any, we never get any certainty surrounding what happened. Like the Leslie Frazier situation, for instance, <laughs> we come to find out that the Brian Dable situation was far worse than we could have imagined. I mean, they didn't even look at each other after the giants played the bills uh, on, on Sunday night football earlier this season. Uh, then of course, what, what, whatever happened to, to lead to the firing, um, of Ken Dorsey. Dorsey, right, and then the whole thing comes out with Sean McDermott, that hit piece there. A lot going on, and winning cures all, that's for sure. Um, it, I, it makes you wonder, if the Bills were at the pedigree they were a decade or so ago, how much worse would we really view all this stuff that's happening? Because it seems odd that every now and then, each season, something happens, and we never have a clear-cut answer as to why it's happening. So what are your thoughts on that, Kev? Where's the toxicity coming from? I see Zbot's point. I think the thing is, like, if you talk to enough defensive players, and I've tried to, um, that it it wasn't an overshock of the Leslie Frazier situation. Um, And it just, quite frankly, which wasn't getting done. Like, and the Bills kind of let him go nicely. Um, But it wasn't really a firing. Uh, I have that on fairly good authority. And it was just a a guy who was honestly looking to up his career and, and find a head coaching gig. Um, that's truly what it was. It seemed weird at the time and the bills themselves thought it was a great time to maybe have a youth movement and go a different direction as well on their defense. And, you know, we'll see what Bobby Babbage can do this year, but I think that there is some interesting, like ultimately Diggs is about Diggs. Josh is kind of the opposite to where he's golfing. Maybe is he golfing too much? I don't know. That's a decision for somebody else who cares about that kind of stuff. Um, it just didn't overly seem to get it done. Josh, um, rehabs in his own way. Diggs thought that maybe he should be doing nothing but practicing all the time. And that's, they weren't able to get through Kansas city. Look, Mahomes has a, a total field house in his own property. So I think at some point like that did affect Diggs. He didn't, wasn't sure if he could get over the KC hump. Um, and Josh wouldn't overly look his way, but you could argue he did last year. Um, you can make the argument that potentially a huge Super Bowl style play that went through Diggs's hands. So at some point, maybe he himself wanted a fresh start, just due to the fact that he likes the young, talented quarterbacks. He's done it his whole career. Um, you know, early on when Kirk first started taking over there, he was showed some promise and he came over to Josh. Now he's going to Stroud. I mean, at the end of the day, I think he's just trying to find the right fit, be closer to family in terms of in Texas and um, continue to ride. I mean, I think he likes to write these stories. I think he likes to see how these things go um, and, and kind of make that story. But maybe he felt that on a rookie quarter on a rookie contract, he maybe felt like there was more of an option to get it done instead of once a quarterback like Kirk or Josh make it big and are making 50 million against the cap or, or 30 this year for the bill 60 next year for Josh that at some point, like he wants to be the one to make sure that his 20 to 25 million against the cap isn't going to bother anybody. So I, I, I mean, ultimately I think that it's a rental, um, and I don't think he was going to be your pass this year, regardless of how this this went down. Got it. And Richie comes in and says, look at these beautiful three musketeers. But seriously, looking at the board, if we want a top <laughs> wide receiver, Jets aren't trading their 10 to a divisional rival. Eight, nine, or 12. I definitely want to go back to this question here for a second. Digs the Dallas 2025. I mean, <laughs> listen, Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised at this point, man. Honestly, like, I mean, Houston hooked him up. 
because he's still going to be at an age where he could probably still demand for like a solid three, four year contract the year following this one and get like Mike Evans money. For well, it makes so much sense. Free agency. Jerry loves a big name to put seats in the stands and sell jerseys. And you got this brother there. I hadn't even given that any thought, but when you look at the fact that he will be a free agent after this year and he's already in Texas and the rumors surrounding him going to Dallas were uh, heating up before we even got in discussions about Stefan Diggs potentially leaving Buffalo, it almost makes too much sense. I could very easily see that if it winds up coming down to him leaving Houston. Yeah, most definitely. But Agreed. That brings me back uh, right to that initial question. First, Super Chat. Shout out to Richie for hooking it up. Thank you, my friend. Um, yeah, guys, listen, where our current wide receiver room stands, looking pretty damn bleak. I'm not going to lie to you. Curtis Samuel, we have Khalil Shakir. We have Justin Shorter for some reason. Everyone's obsessed with that guy. I think <laughs> that he is the next coming. Please tell me that y'all get that in the comments as well. At least 10 times every single video. Yo, what about Justin Shorter, dude? He's going to be a baller. How many times do you get that? <laughs> Well, like Next everything season. else, I'm just seeing the divide. I'm sure you guys are. It's like the division between this fan base on almost everything. It's, it's never crazy. like He's no an one's extra ever, Bernard. I know. No one's ever telling the line. It's either you are so hard pressed on one side or the other. I mean, either right now you have to pretty much pick a position where the Bills have not regressed at all. They're as good as they've been. Maybe if they maybe they're better without Diggs because he's not going to be tweeting for the Bills. There's that side of things. And then there's the side of things where people immediately think, and this this not this isn't just the fan base. This is uh, a full panel of people making a million plus dollars to be on ESPN, telling you that the New York Jets are now your current favorite to win the AFC East. They had that same take last year. We all know how that went. But this is what has occurred from this. You lose Stephon Diggs, and the Buffalo Bills all of a sudden become the uh, the shoe in for third place in the AFC East. They're not going to make the playoffs. They're going to be a punching bag. I'm here to tell you right now that the odds for the Bills in the AFC East and in the AFC and the Super Bowl have moved very, very, very marginally. They're still the favored. They're still the favorite to win the AFC East. They're still tied for third to win the AFC, and they're tied for fourth to win the Super Bowl. The Bills still have Josh Allen, and the Bills are not currently set at wide receiver, and I think we are going to find that out very soon here. Are the Bills not as good today as they were maybe yesterday or certainly a couple of weeks ago, as Brandon Bean alluded to? Absolutely. But there's no telling how good they can potentially be with a new script being written here. The fact that you lose Diggs, who towards the end of the year, I think three or four of his final six games, he had uh, 40 yards or less, and they wound up rattling off six to seven and were a play away from beating the Chiefs in the divisional. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really hard to say they're going to they're gonna drop that down that far where, to where you're seeing these, these constant arguments online uh you know to that point where oh, all of a sudden now it's just it's over it's done uh, i mean it's certainly going to be an uphill climb but i mean you see it right there on the screen the, the yeah. miami dolphins had a three-game lead last year on these bills and at that time stefan diggs wasn't doing anything compared to what we're used to him doing and they wound up burying the the, the dolphins late in the season in the final game to take the to take the afc east they had a 0.2 percent chance to do it about six weeks prior to that so if you're going to write them off after what we saw last year i i don't know what to tell you did it's, you see Diggs's Diggs's production in those eight games too? It was 40 yeah, yards a game. That's what I'm it saying. was 14 catches for 140 yards in his last playoff games. Yeah. It was uh honestly his separation has dressed. So if you want to be in an advanced analytics or box score, take your pick. Sure. His advanced analytics, 2.6 yards per separation, down a good half of a yard. He wasn't getting open. Um, and the, and the targets didn't really diminish, diminish, Kevin. He was still getting targets. That's the thing. It wasn't like they took him completely out of the offense. So but yeah, I tried to hide it myself. Like, oh, you know, it's just Brady. Brady's trying to figure this thing out. Like, he's running the ball a lot. He's running right. this 12 personnel. Yeah. But at the same time, he showed big signs of regression. And yeah. personally, Brandon Bean took advantage of what he thought was a high second-round pick for a rental. And thus, the odds will show it to me. The Dolphins got trounced by the Chiefs last year. They, they didn't even show up. I mean, can, we, how can you even trust Tua under 40 degrees? You cannot. So I don't know what you're supposed to do in January. What are you supposed to do in January with the Miami Dolphins? What are you and supposed it's not to do? Like they, they lost a ton of starters as well in this free agency period, the Miami Dolphins. It's not like they've gotten exceptionally better. And everybody wants to tell you the New York Jets are all of a sudden front runners again because uh, Aaron Rodgers, 40 years old off an ACL tear, is going to is going to win MVP again. So it's playing on that same turf as well. I just, uh, <laughs> we, we got to take a breath. I mean, there's a lot happening. And I know it, 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 even for me, it is... Uh, it is uh, overwhelming, but 
I, I don't know. I don't. I don't feel like it's doomsday over here. It, yeah. There's almost a moment of excitement no, to me about what's next. And, and the second part of that comment, Z bought by Brandon Bean, was we play in September. So like, exactly. if you don't think we're going to entertain all options from now, April third at the time until September, you're crazy. He referenced maybe adding a veteran. He's referenced multiple rookies. He's meeting with the tops. Can you convince me that he's not going to trade up for a Dunze? You can't. I don't think so. No. I don't think so, but that could be in the cards. Could he inquire about a vet receiver? He absolutely could. He now has the actual cash. A lot of people are like, well, Terry Pagula saved the money. Not Terry Pagula has, we're talking about the bills here. Terry Pagula has no problem sinking any form of upfront extensions into his players. Every single player gets it. Every player that Bean wants to keep, he's allowed to keep. That is not true. Look at what the Bengals are going through. So Terry Pagula very much will use that $20 million he just saved in actual cash, $28 million in cap he just saved. And there, there are ways you could go get Brandon Ayuk if you want. It's not that out of the question for Brandon Bean to A, select a player at 28 and then make a crazy move with a 2025 draft choice. Yeah. See... See, the thing is, is that I've been getting a lot of, oh, and so the Bills are done, man. Like, you're going to lose out on all that production from Davis and Diggs. I'm convinced that I feel like everyone just does not watch Buffalo Bills football. No, they don't. That they literally just box score watch, and then that's it. They're like, oh, yeah, well, he was a big part of your offense at the beginning of the season. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, well, how did that go, man? We were 6-6, six and six and we were already prepping to find excuses for missing the playoffs that year. And then our offensive coordinator gets fired, and we have somebody new come in. Like, I mean, read the room at this point. We were planning an exit. We were trying to lay the foundation of life after digs the second that Brady ended up taking over. And the that craziness on top of that, it's not even the regression of the Bills. It's also the faith, the blind faith being put in organizations that have not proven that they're capable of taking the crown if the crown's up for the taking. The Miami Dolphins last year is the most perfect example imaginable. They had that thing under lock and key. All they had to do was not ruin their pants. And not only did they ruin their pants, I mean, they, 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 they burn a hole in them. And, and you you watch how it all unfolded and you ask yourself, if they weren't going to be, if they didn't get had last year, what makes you think that they're, that they're capable of being had because of what's occurred this offseason? I mean, what they did last year, you got to remember the other thing too, what they were able to accomplish last year being put in the hole that they were, they did that with an absolutely decimated defense a interim offensive coordinator and a, basically an entirely different style of offense than we come accustomed to watching from these bills. And they did it with pretty damn good success. And now you have an entirety of an off season with Joe Brady to really dig his, his uh, it really sink his teeth into this, this whole new gig he has and really find a way to get the most out of guys like he was able to do in the interim period last year, but he's got far more time to do it. He's got uh, the ability to add things that maybe we didn't see last year, remove things that maybe were too far into the playbook to not be removed a season ago. But we saw on a dime last year the Bills be able to transition to a ground-and-pound style team where Josh Allen is able to be a part of that as well, and then taking things underneath, moving the ball down the field incrementally, milking the clock. They were able to do things that we were not accustomed to seeing from them. And like we keep you know, emphasizing, it's not like we're, it's not like the Bills aren't going to miss digs. Of course they're going to miss Diggs. He's a wide receiver one. He's been one of the better wide receivers in this league in, in recent memory here. Of course you're going to miss a guy like that. Of course you're going to miss Jordan Poyer, who's been a staple for this team. You're going to miss all of these guys, right? But I just look at the offensive angle of it alone last year, and they were putting up similar points to what they were putting up early in the year where Stephon Diggs was getting 100-plus yards and a touchdown a game. They were still scoring the same amount of points. The time of possession went up. It was just a different style, and I think people confused – Josh Allen not throwing for 300 yards and three TDs. They confuse that as this offense not working. I thought the offense was was working to the degree in which they needed it to work last year to get the yes. job done. People want to say the offense in that Kansas City Chiefs divisional game was a poor game plan. They wouldn't have been perfect saying that game plan. If, if Chris Jones doesn't nail Josh Allen's arm and, and potentially gets that ball to Shakir in the back of the end zone. It, things could be dramatically different if a player two go a different direction. I thought this team was heading in the right path last year, and that was with a whole lot of turmoil surrounding them starting in the middle of the season. And it's it's wild because you know what? And, and so the doubters are out here, folks. But as we can see over here on BetUS, we still have the Buffalo Bills at plus 165 for winning the division, plus 1,400 fifth best odds. This is after the Stephon Diggs trade. So if you don't believe us, 
We'll leave in the sports books because we all know that Vegas never loses. By the way, BetUS is matching your first three deposits up to 125% plus 10% gambler's insurance, folks. And just to show you how absolutely confident I am that this is happening already. Mr. Dan Mitchell's throwing $200 hairs. Okay, $100 is the limit of what I could put down on here. Place my bet. Let's do 100 it. Bucks. My money is where my Free mouth money. is. Free right money. now, folks, it's easy, a solid little return. I'm not going to be able to get it until December, but I cannot wait for the return. I'm going to go on ahead and put several other slips. Folks, there's plenty of other sports to bet on. Baseball, obviously, March Madness is still going on. And then, obviously, some playoff hockey, for example, some table tennis, some cornhole. They have it all over on BetUS. Hit that link in the description and make it happen, because that's exactly what we strongly, strongly encourage. Now, okay, we started teasing around some options. And then, Kevin, I heard you say, hey, he might go for a veteran this year and then maybe double dip with some rookies in the draft. But, okay, you're the GM of the Bills. What do you want to do to address this wide re- this wide receiver hole that obviously we do need to fill going into it? Saw, and by you- the way, dude, I mean, I see so many, like, Finns fans and Jets fans in the chat. Be like, oh, you guys are cooked. Like, folks, the draft is three weeks away. And so do you really think that we're just about to forfeit all of our draft picks and just not do anything? We literally have 19 picks over the next two years. Yeah, yeah, we have 19 picks in the next two years, man. Relax. Listen, I know you're trying to manifest things, but how far has that manifestation been working for you? The dedication is admirable, though. The dedication is admirable. They're never not. They're never not uh, standing ground on it. So you almost have to tip your cap to it to some degree. It's because eventually they might be right. Well, yeah, that's the thing. years, 30 years right. down the road, they might be right. And when Josh they'll Allen be, retires, they'll be right. right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, one of them has got to stick, right? Just you like, know what I mean? Just like you were, we were right when Brady retired. Same thing. Exactly. Yeah. Precisely. <laughs> Once Brady retired, we were we were certainly right. Kev, what do you think is the perfect plan for this wide receiver? I'm talking prospects. I'm talking potential free agents. I'm talking trading up. I'm talking give me your diabolical plan to upgrade our wide receiver. We talked about this yesterday, and the biggest thing is how much are you willing to trade up to get one of those top three to pick nine? Our friends said at 10, we're not going to be able to get that draft choice. So how much to get to nine to get to that position to probably get Roma Dunze, who is a guy that would fit with his contested catch rate, with his route running ability, what he's able to do in a spread style offense, what he's been able to do with his separation. What would that cost you? That's going to cost you something similar to two ones, a two and a four. Like, I just don't think it gets done for under that. At some point, that's four fairly high assets. Is that the best way to spend all this great capital and money that you've saved? It's tough for me to wrap my head around that in a pretty, very strong, we're going to say very strong wide receiver year. Um, So my plan consists of stay around 28, see what's going on. If Xavier Leggett's your guy, I still think it's going to be Lad McConkey. You're going to play some defense with him as well, making sure he doesn't reach Mahomes. So there's that avenue that you're going to take off the bat in the draft. I don't think it's crazy to pick up the phone and see what's going on with the veteran world. Like, hey, you're not going to sign him anyways. We have some new found cap space next year. The Bills will have as much as $80 million in cap space if they do just some simple moves. It's not crazy stuff anymore. They're talking about starting the year around 30 to 40. You're talking about potentially doing something with Vaughn. And you're talking about saving money with Josh Allen's $60 million against the cap, which he will not count against the cap that for that much next year. So the bills can make a phone call and say, Hey, you want a draft choice? We'll take, you know, your receiver off your hands that you you're clearly struggling with signing. So I think that that is a very open option, Dan. And that is one that I'd like to entertain because he referenced one in one to me. That tells me that there's a vet in play. Is it a Tyler Boyd? Is it an OBJ? Or are they thinking bigger? That's the bigger question that I'm that I'm that I'm answering, asking to myself. But why not pick up the phone and see what Brandon Ayuk is going for? Because he'd be an instant fit in his prime into this offense. And then you supplement him with an Xavier Legat or uh Lad McConkey. And all of a sudden your room is absolutely better than it's it better. was last year. <laughs> yeah, like you true. can't even have these troll comments anymore. Like your yeah. your your roster upgraded with we forgot to mention Lyle Collins signing six point five million dollar deal. If he gets back to anything of what he was able to do, he is a left guard competitor and a swing tackle competitor. So the Bills are in a really good position now with still having their running game, still having their offensive line, still having their two tight ends, and they're just revamping their receiver room with having already upgrade with with Curtis Samuel over Hardy and then still having um, Khalil Shakir. So if they fill those two spots, 
they're going to be in better position than they were. And you can't judge them on April 4th because it makes zero sense because Brandon Bean still has too many options going forward before September. Uh, now, you did just break the news to me. Oh, so that we okay. Find Lyle Collins. Yeah, there you go. There you so have I it. must have not been on Twitter, but that's good. Yep. That's up to 6.5 I know it's not the move that we wanted to see. And so I know all of us wanted to go ahead and be like, damn, bro. Like, where's the T Higgins news break? Where's the Brandon <laughs> Ayuk? And listen, you know what? Like, a lot of people might try and come on and be like, oh, man, that's financially. Impossible. People are saying he's going to start well, you know a left what? guard, Dan. He's a starting left guard right now in this league. I love that. I absolutely love that investing in the trenches. And before anybody says, hey, listen, you know what? There's no way that the Bengals are going to trade someone to a rival. Okay. Look at so many moves this year. Okay. There's been betrayals yeah. left and right. All right. And then say, oh, there's no way that 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 we can afford those people. All right. There was no way in hell that we could afford trading digs. Look what happens, man. Listen, everything is on the damn table right now. Everything is on the table because if anything is proved, we don't know what the hell is going on in that front office. Yeah. z what are you thinking? What are you thinking about the Bills receiver room? What, how are we going to fix it? To that quick point that you just made, Dan, about – because I've been saying – and this is just me personally. I mean, this is how I'd operate, but, uh, you know, very good. There, this, this is probably one of uh, several reasons why I would not be a very good GM. But the one reason being if I'm uh, Cincinnati's GM, there's just no way I send – T Higgins to Buffalo, but I was uh, listening to Florio and Chris Sims earlier. They got in a heated debate about Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs and all this stuff. And they were talking about, because they really don't know much of anything either as to how the bills got to this point. But Sims alluded to the fact that he did hear that Stephon Diggs was given permission to seek a trade for, to any team, but the Kansas city chiefs. And I found that to be interesting because you would imagine there'd be other teams involved within that, you know, X these guys off type list. I would, you would imagine Baltimore would be in there. You'd imagine Cincinnati might be in there, but when you do trade them to Houston, I mean, I don't know if everyone quite realizes just how young and loaded Houston is. I mean, that team yeah. who was not supposed to do anything last year wound up surprising everyone and not just surprising everyone. I mean, they, they instantly became a team. Nobody wanted to see, and they're only going to get better. They got much better defensively this off season. And then of course the addition of mix in, Obviously, another year for Stroud. Now, Stephon Diggs, you're going to get Tank Dell back from injury. I mean, they're absolutely loaded. So it's not like sending him to Houston was some poo-poo move. It wasn't like sending him to Carolina or the Arizona. I mean, that's sending him to a contender that you are 100% going to be playing in a primetime slot this upcoming season. So to your point, is it is it totally off the table if, if the Bengals absolutely have to make a move for Higgins and the Bills are willing to find a way to make that happen? I suppose not. The The question that I ask myself is if I'm in this situation that Brandon Bean's currently in and what he's pretty much showed us thus far is he is making this transition to youth. He is making this transition to this next chapter that's going to be predicated on these younger talents that are going to be the next wave, the future of the Buffalo Bills. Obviously, you would love to have a veteran presence like Brandon Ayuk. You'd love to have a presence like T. Higgins. It would immediately, you could almost argue it would, it would just instantly replace the loss of Stephon Diggs. But I, this is why I veer more towards the idea of if you're going to give up the capital that it would probably cost you to get a guy like that, I'm more in the camp of using that capital to try and move up in the draft. Mm. Get a guy that not only could potentially be as good as one of those guys, but get him from next to nothing for four or five years and have him immediately come into this offense and build around Josh Allen with the young with the young uh, offense that's currently in place there with Shakir, James Cook, Dalton Kincaid. Have them all kind of come up together. Now, you, of course, are missing that veteran leadership. You could argue you're getting that from Curtis Samuel or Matt Collins, but this is still the first year for them in Buffalo. So it really is kind of a moot point. It doesn't matter. But the, the angle that it seems Brandon Bean is taking this offseason, he has no qualms in just getting rid of guys that are almost on their way out the door. And I think that this last move with Diggs truly shows you his willingness, his ability to move off from guys that you really couldn't fathom them moving off from. It seems like the, the mentality in the building right now is it's the next chapter of the Buffalo Bills. So for that reason, I think they move up. The question is, Will they? Will How they do? What, 
That's the question. I mean, you, I saw, you I'm sure you guys saw it being tossed around yesterday. What the uh, Atlanta Falcons gave up to the Browns back in 2011 for Julio Jones. That was a the, the example being thrown around. The best point that was made with that tweet, I forgot who who put it out there, but the best point that was made, I think it was uh, Monson, was it, from uh, PFF? But the point that was made was that the guy essentially has to be Julio Jones, and that's the key here. You can give up whatever you, 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 it doesn't matter. Whatever you give up, if Roma Dunze or Malik Neighbors ends up being Julio Jones, Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, no one's going to look back and say, man, I can't believe the Bills gave up a, a future first round, this year's first round, a future second round. Nobody's going to say that. But if he winds up being a mid-tier guy, if he winds up being the Sammy Watkins of oh, Buffalo in this generation, it's going to be franchise altering in the opposite way. So it really all comes down to if you're going to make that move, it paying it, it, it hitting. Because if it does, I don't think what you give up matters. So that's probably where the safety blanket comes from getting an IU and Higgins. And I understand that element as well. But based on what I've seen from being this offseason, I feel like the direction is moving more towards focusing in on the draft and then maybe adding other veteran presence that aren't those big names, those big dollar signs like Ayuk or Higgins. But fellas, the, the main question is, do you move up from 28 to the late teens, early 20s, or do you go all in, try and get one of these generational wide receivers as they're being labeled and, and hopefully find your digs in the draft? They have not done this. Bean has not done this. The, the entire organization has not gotten a guy like that for Josh Allen in the draft. Is this the time to do it? And you have to ask yourself, is there going to be a better time with literally no concrete solution at wide receiver right now that you feel comfortable about would this not be the time to do it if they feel as though they're in the position to either make a move off the off the draft board or within the draft board in my opinion there's no better time than now if they're going to do it it's this year it's now who are those guys you're imagining right now like i mean obviously i know that like you're a massive romo dunze fan Love but it. who else would be okay that like you would be like, okay, he's probably going to be a stud in the NFL. See, this is the difficulty behind it to me because I look at it and I think it, it, it's great to, uh, to to do this hypothesis, right, of thinking about the possibility of the Bills doing this. The reason I feel like it it, it may not happen, it might not be the Bills' uh, lack of willingness to do it, but it might be due to the willingness of other teams to make a move with them based on what the Bills have to offer. Like for the Chicago Bears instance, do the Bears want to hold on to that nine pick and take a wide receiver themselves? Or if they want to move, there surely has to be other teams looking at that nine spot and wanting to move into it. Are the Bills going to be able to match what a team, another team might have to offer? So I think it all comes down to how the draft falls early on. If we see like four straight wide receivers go and we get down to like seven or eight and you see neighbors or Odunze still there and you're able to get into that bear spot, that to me is what would be the, the safest way to land one of those guys. But to me, Dan, any of those concrete top 12-ish guys, I'd be willing to make the move on, whether Odunze is the one to fall or Neighbors is the one to fall. But you know, it really all depends on how I think the early round of the draft goes. And I don't know if they're going to be able to wait around and see because it feels like once one guy goes, the run's going to start. And to uh, Kevin's point earlier, when we're talking about McConkey, for instance, I think that if you wind up seeing it fall a certain way and you're not able to give up what you want to give up and you're going to have to overextend, I personally would be fine with staying where they're at for the, you know, the, the beginning of the draft and then making their move for a guy like McConkey because you have to make sure that they're not, he's not taken in those early 20 picks. So I, I feel like no matter what, a move up has to be made. Um, personally, though, I guess the best way to wrap this up would be I just need to see wide receiver in round one. That's the best way to put it. Whether they go all the yeah. way up and go all in or they move up marginally to get a guy in the early 20s, late teens, at the end of the day, I will be satisfied with a guy that they feel was worthy of a first-round pick so long to me as it is a wide receiver. See, at this point, I feel like my first priority – is is that I mean I'm not really confident that like we would be able to get up uh right into the top 10, but I would be fine trading up marginally 16, 17 and grabbing Brian Thomas Jr. I feel like that would be completely fine. I would be fine with sending over a second as well. 
And then I would be fine with swapping first round picks. Maybe even that newly acquired second that we had for in 2025. That would make sense to me. Um, because I feel like that, like we're also ignoring that we should expect some sort of development from a Dalton Kincaid year two, and then a Shakir going into it as well. And then obviously our run game going into it. So I would be okay there, but I've started accepting the fact I'm hell bent on double dipping. I'm fine with taking a wide receiver in the first and the second, say that we just stay put at 28. I'm fine with taking a receiver at, you know, uh, sort of right at 28 and maybe even wanting to like have the trade up in, like in the second, if necessary, would love lab McConkey and then second round pick Xavier Leggett bang, bang right after that. And then I found it interesting too, because we ended up having a meeting with Trey Benson, which was kind of like a head scratcher. I'm not sure if you ended up seeing that Kevin. Yeah. I mean, he would it be is, interesting. It and it, I mean, it is, I but it's Cook, not but... shocking. It's not yeah. shocking. You don't have running backs on their roster. They run the ball super efficiently. Like, I do believe Ty Johnson's more of a three. I mean, he's getting paid minimum, very minimum, I and mean, with the salary benefit attached to him. They're looking at him as a three. Like, they yeah. have a very wide open number two running back role. And before you know it, these guys, I mean, Cook's in year three. They have a four year deal. He, like, we're not giving players second running back contracts. So you do have to have somebody in the pipeline behind him. And I, I, I think running back is a sneaky use of some of these picks. It's not crazy that the Bills are going to fully revamp this offense. I don't think that it's crazy to assume that. So especially after the Diggs deal, like I, yeah. I really think that they entertained running back more every year than we want to admit. I know that they like Travis Etienne. I know that they like Najee Harris. They obviously like James Cook. They obviously were looking at Jonathan Taylor back when he was a draft prospect. They've always been around. They definitely were involved with uh, Christian McCaffrey, like whether Bean will fully admit it or not, he definitely sent an offer. So I think ultimately they would be interested in adding to the running back room. And I, I don't think it's a crazy shocker, but there is a gaping hole at RB2. Like there's an RB1 and an RB3. Great. Both, both good at those spots, but there is a gaping RB2. And just like any other hole we have on the roster, they need to fill it. So I wouldn't be shocked to run 12 to have another running back option. If James Cook's go, James Cook goes down, they're in an interesting spot at that position. Um, so I think that they'd like to have a four-year guy in there on a cheap deal that can do a lot of different things that they were missing last season. And don't forget, yeah. they had five different running backs in and out last year. They yeah. only have two on the roster at the moment. And so to be honest with you, I think that Trey Benson's the best running back that's going to come out of that class. I'm convinced. Maybe the Bills agree. And so I like him better than Ray. Um, and so Ray Davis out of Kentucky. And so I like him better than a lot of the, you know, but I mean, listen, I know that like, we love getting that defensive talent, but I'm getting to a point right now where I'm like, listen, first three rounds, go offense, yep. go skill players, go wide receiver, wide receiver. Then Trey. Benson. I will say, I will say back to the talk of trading up and whatnot. I would, I would say my desire to, to, to move up, to get a guy and make sure you get the guy you're after in the, in, in the first round, no matter how far up that is, I, I, it, the satisfaction would be supplemented by the idea of staying at 28 or moving up very little, getting a guy and then double dipping at round two. That to me, I'd be equally as satisfied. Either you go and get a major, you know, you make a major splash in first round or you kind of double dip, maybe not the biggest name in the first round, but you're able to add two pieces. You just lose your two, you know, your wide receiver one and wide receiver two, whether you felt Davis was the two or not. If you're able to do that in the first two rounds, not only do you fill a major need, but you also double your opportunity for one of these guys to really hit because you know, you know how it is. It's not, it's not like the first round is the only guarantee for one of these guys to blow up. We've seen the later round picks turn into absolute studs. So you double your chance as well. If that first round pick, it doesn't end up being your superstar. Potentially the second round pick winds up being that for you. Uh, and it all works out, but the more, the merrier to me on offense, that's pretty much my approach to this entire draft. Absolutely. Salas comes in and says shorter was awful in college. <laughs> Salas comes in and said the bills are still going to win the AFC East 11 to 13 games. And depending on the Little, wide... my man, <laughs> and depending on the wide receiver, we draft, we could be headed to new Orleans in February for Mardi Gras. Thanks for tuning in. Whittle. <laughs> I love that. So <laughs> <nice> Rome... <laughs> uh, Richie fresh is coming in saying, remember, and the chiefs in 2017 moved from 27 to 10 and only gave up 27. And then a third rounder and a 2018 first round. Guess who they got moving up? Isn't that crazy? 
excuse me while I go edge myself just thinking about it. I, I love it. I love I love it. Patrick Mahomey. Shout out Diggs for finally getting a real QB. All right, man. And so you better get those trios running up on Fortnite, nerd. Anyway, um, yeah, guys, listen. Here's the thing. There's a lot of questions about this team. That's all it is. It's just one gigantic question. question. Isn't it weird, though? It, the, the, the sole entity of Josh Allen makes that question just – so much less stressful. Like I can't imagine, even if it, if even if we took it down just a tier, like if we don't, if we go from like the top three to five quarterbacks, if we just took that down to like the five to ten range, I, I'd be probably borderlining on panic mode right now. That's just how much Josh Allen has been able to infiltrate my mindset and pretty much calm me down in my thought process of where I think this team will be at the end of the season, because we've seen multiple examples of this team having the best regular season imaginable, a very shitty regular season, something in between and figuring it out. And really at the end of the day, we saw this last year, you just got to get in. And once you're in, you, you, it's any, it's anybody's game. I mean, we saw what the Packers were able to do towards the end of the year and how they were able to turn it on. What Houston was capable of doing, blowing out Cleveland in the first round. So, you just got to get in there, and it's really hard to imagine with Josh Allen, fully healthy, of course, that they're not going to be able to get in. And then from there, that's where you know that's where you all the questions come from surrounding this organization. But th there's so many people right now just saying that they're not even a a playoff contender, and I just don't know how you come away with that mindset based on uh, all that's happened here. I have no idea. <laughs> I sincerely have no idea. Well, folks, I'll tell you what. And so I'm not sure about you, but I feel like I'm done with the digs conversation. And so I'm going to try my best not to bring this up anymore. I feel like I'm going to move on. Hopefully we have something to be excited about, like once the draft comes. Or maybe Brandon Bean, you know, later tonight at 2 a.m., we see something break that Ayuk is now a Buffalo Bill. Maybe. Well, let me ask you guys this real quick. Just in regard to let's let's go through the hypothetical just real quick about moving up in the first round. If they were to do that, do you foresee that being a day of draft type move? Or do you see that? Because it's clearly obvious right now that there's the majority of these GMs out there have to know that Brandon Bean is going to be honing in on a wide receiver. I mean, I feel like that cover has been blown once Diggs walks out the door yesterday. Yeah. So you see a move being made prior to the draft? Or is this something, if it were to happen, that you see happening the day of? I mean, I'll tell you what. I mean, I'm sure that like as we're doing this show right now, he's on the phone. I would hope. Right. <laughs> yeah, dude, he's on the phone right now. He's putting everything. I mean, it just depends on what these teams are willing to do, man. I mean, it's just more of like, will they allow it to go through? Like, I think his intention is getting it done sooner rather than later. Do you think that he's following it up with a vet move too? I mean, it almost screams to me like having a vet move ready behind it because it's rare to want to go up unless you're going up real high, like into like a guaranteed range, like top seven. Um and you're competing. The problem with this is you're competing in a year where there could be four cubes and you're right. competing against these teams that are coming up for that. And you're not going to pay the cube price. So you're going to have to wait on the QBs. And now you're going to be waiting more in that nine to 10, but you can't guarantee your, let's just use nine. You can't guarantee yourself to make that deal. What if they're gone and the QBs are still there? Mm. Like, so what, like you, it, it, you're saying you challenge. can't take the risk of not having the veteran going into the draft. Cause if you don't get up there, then, then Correct. what's the solution? Yeah. Because that, you may sense. not be able to work and you may be bidding against teams with quarterbacks. And by the times you can get up there, uh, they're gone. And then, then now what, maybe you still have a vet you can fall back on and be like, you know, pick up the phone and entertain what you were working on. But ultimately like, it's a conspicuous time to make a trade on April 3rd. There's no way Bean had to do it then. He could have right. waited as long as he wanted, um, especially could have waited till draft day. Uh, absolutely could have uh, before teams were allocated their picks. So to me, I think it's a matter of, you're right. I think there's a move that are, is going to be made to follow this because he tipped his hand to your point a little bit, at least somewhat where the Bills need a receiver. So like you tip their hand. So he's got to have an agreement close or an agreement in principle at least a gentleman's agreement, which are very honored in the NFL somewhere on the lines right now. Is it yeah. for a vet or is it to move up as high as nine? If Roma Dunze is there. And if he's not, do they have a backup plan to go get a veteran? Because you got to come away with something. Um, and you don't know for, you can't make that deal to nine right now because you can't have it go wrong. And then what are you going to do? Go up and get a defensive player. Like, what are you going to do? Exactly. If something goes wrong. 
you can't make that move right now. So unfortunately, even if you're feeling pretty good that Roma Dunze would be there, they got to wait on it. Maybe there's a veteran that they feel has a real reason to have needed to save yeah. that digs money. That's what's sticking out to me, Dan. So could you yeah, imagine it makes so much more sense though, Kevin, the way you framed it, because it's already a risk in the draft going into the draft, trying to hope that guy hits. But now the, the way you said that you're, you're basically doubling the risk, the risk. going into yeah. it with, out anybody else in place because if you do go in there and you lose that hand the first round's your blackjack yeah. hand, the dealer strikes 21 and you lose i mean you're you're dude. you're screwed you're screwed you oh can't get- yeah dude listen Come man like, it's breaking news the bills have just traded up to the seventh round pick and then the first three are qbs and then four five and six are uh harrison neighbors and odunze what are you gonna look at <laughs> dallas turner like what are you gonna do there dallas turner a you imagine oh, this fan base if they traded up to nine and took a D lineman. You imagine what, what the mutiny Jared verse? Like, what are you gonna do if you're up there and the receivers are gone? So that's why it's a super duper risk. You can't just reach on Brian Thomas, I don't think. Maybe you would. I don't I don't know, but yeah. Uh, I mean the Chargers, it's, the Chargers are very interesting to me too, because there's a lot of speculation out Brock there that Bowers. even well, they seem like they seem like they're so wide receiver needy, right? Losing Keenan Allen and of course and Mike Williams, but a lot of people in the know are saying that Harbaugh doesn't strike them strike them as a guy that's going to immediately come in and go flashy wide receiver at, at pick right. five. I think if you do know Harbaugh, that makes sense. That could really alter the mindset too at five because if one of those wide receivers goes at five, it gets a lot more difficult to land one. But if you do go four straight quarterbacks, then you go wide receiver. Uh, you don't go wide receiver at five with the Chargers. Then I think that's where it gets really interesting. I feel like it really starts with the Chargers at five. Does Joe Shane make the same move Brandon Bean make? Does he move out at some point with finally make a deal with Brand, his old best friend, golfing buddy, Brandon Bean um, in New York? That's the well, question. I don't know if he's got time, Kev, because what I've been told is he's on the phone with Bean trying to offer up six for Josh Allen. That's all I keep oh, seeing. On that's right. We're going to get six anyways. I forgot right. about that. So we're going <laughs> to we're gonna, we're gonna have six and nine. That's okay. right. Yeah, we're going to both. So Mitch Trubisky will probably have the – he'll probably have Marvin Harrison Jr. to throw to, so that'll be exciting. Okay. Uh, there we yeah. go. Hey, look, look at that, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in to another edition of the Bills Roundtable. Listen, all right, it's funny because Mario actually texted me during the show. He's like, hey, I'm watching. Here's a stat. I'm like, why don't you come in? Nothing yet. <laughs> Mario, hope to see you next week, my friend. You missed a great show. Z, any final words? What's going on in the Fanatics channel, man? Uh, me and Rico are going to be live tomorrow at noon. Uh, him and I, like I told you guys last week, we got in a huge argument. <laughs> <laughs> about drafting a wide receiver uh, in round one. And his whole thing was that it was going to uh, make Diggs even more disgruntled. So I cannot wait to hop on with him tomorrow at noon and talk about the situation that's currently at hand because his whole take was we have to defend the honor of Diggs and we'll upset him if we go round one. Those tables have turned dramatically. So tomorrow, Buffalo Fanatics YouTube channel at noon. Uh, me and Rico will be talking more about this, and I'm dying to hear. I'll tell you, out of everybody I know over this dig thing, Rico's heart has shattered the most. He is uh, beat up over this. So oh, yeah. uh, I'm going to see what he has to say. <laughs> what you got, Gavin? What's going on with uh, with Bills and Buffalo? Yeah, man? shout out to my guys over at Brumblings, too. I heard the news. Dude, um, I did. It's yeah, rough, dude. Man. I was going to ask you guys there. about that off camera. but what you know, what ter- Oh, they, yeah. like They cut their Buffalo entire Rumblings team. Is done. So they're pulling the plug. Why? I guess Fox, Fox pulled Media, out. It's a form of layoff. That, that, I guess. That, wasn't, that wasn't Bleacher Report anymore, wasn't it? Wasn't it Bleacher? Vox, Report? Vox took over the financial Media. backing. Yeah. Yeah. They, Buff can't, they can't run it independently. Or they, they're taking the I IP. Not. Yeah, I, they must be holding the IP. I'd assume. Oh my god! When did that happen? Like two hours ago. No they just shit. literally fired like all everybody. Here. Yeah, yeah. We saw something on Bruce exclusive's Twitter. He just said that. Uh, <laughs> Nice. Uh, so well, I've been on. informed that Vox Media is eliminating the podcast network for BR and by extension, my show on that network. I'm not sure what the future holds of the Bruce exclusive, but I love y'all dearly for all the years of listening. Thank you. Yeah, so shout out to all of my, my friends. Well, I'll tell there. you this. Bruce yeah. is a class act and one of the best, and yeah. uh, it will not take very long for him to get back onto his feet if he has the desire to do so. But that's a uh, that's rough to hear. I mean, no no warning or anything, man. That's not, that's, not from that's the sounds crazy. of it. Yeah, so nice. definitely want to shout them all out over there. I know Sarah Larson, you got John Fina, you got yep. uh, Joe Miller, you got oh. Spence. All yeah. good guys, man. I mean, we, we're we're so lucky. The I, I don't think people realize because you're not a fan of another team, you probably you would have no reason to. But when it comes to the Bills yep. and this community, it does not get more 
deep or more, there's no there's not there's no more variety anywhere else. There's no more passion and everybody for the most part, you'd be hard pressed to find a bad dude. So it's uh it's a real great thing we have. And I I I know all those guys will bounce back. That's that sucks to hear though. Yeah, yeah for sure. So I want to yeah, shout them out, but we got same thing, man. You can catch me Wednesdays at seven. We're doing live day three coverage. It'll be fun. Um, hope you know you guys can pop on over at some point during the show or some come tom- sometime coming up. But yeah, always no look forward to spitballing, man. Always need uh, differing opinions um, and, and commentary. So really appreciate the roundtable as always. Yeah, man, most definitely. I promise you, we will have a real roundtable one of these days. <laughs> there will be a Triangle. fourth person here, Mario. All right, guys. See y'all next All right. week on Thursday. Much love, everybody. Go Bills. Peace.